dear Heavenly Father, this is your message to give to us all today. Please be Lord of my thoughts, Lord of my words. Please give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that are willing to follow you wherever you lead us. We give you thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Throughout Bible history, there are instances where God has reached the limit of his forbearance. Uh, and beyond this point comes a, a time of judgment. So whenever the children of disobedience have come to this limit, to this line, God has sent messengers with a message of love and mercy, of a call to reconsider this inevitable course of self-destruction to which they're headed. Sometimes he has pleaded for many years. Sometimes it was but a few hours. But the message was always, turn back. Why will you perish? Our God is a God of love, the Bible tells us. He's not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us should come to repentance. So whether it was up in heaven or, or here on this earth, throughout history, there have been the honest in heart who have heard God's plea and have obeyed his call, have answered his call. They have not abandoned all trust in their maker and they escaped the judgment that was to follow. So it's no different for us down here at the end of time. The signs in nature, the signs in our societal norms, the signs in violence and lawlessness, the signs of supernatural phenomena, they're all telling us that Jesus is coming soon. We're headed, believe it or not, like it or not, we're headed toward that line of God's forbearance, his hour of judgment, at which time he must intervene to save those who choose life. God will issue one last call to the honest in heart. And this last call you can expect to be the most tender, the most compassionate message that a God of love can give. We find it in the Bible. Let's read it. We find it in the book of Revelation in chapter 14, and it begins at verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Pardon me here. There we go. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. So there it is. That's love's last call. That's the most tender, the most compassionate message a God of love could give. And how do we know this to be true? 
Well, if you read on in chapter 14, the next event that follows is the second coming of Jesus and the harvest of the world. So it's only natural that God would give a message that could penetrate into the hearts of his children. So let's read it again. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, whosoever receives the mark of his name. Don't those words just thrill you to the very depths of your soul? Don't you want to go out from here and share with your friends and your neighbors and your loved ones that beautiful message about the mark of the beast? Or does it give you pause? Do you wonder what kind of response you might get? Do you wonder how a God of love could give such a message? How? Are we to make sense of this? Well, to begin with, this third message is the last one of what we commonly call the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, found in verses 6 to 12. And together, the, the three messages are a collective appeal to place one's trust in God before it's too late. It's to be, it would be like God, uh, well, there's not one part of this message that you could understand independent of the other two. It's kind of like God telling the antediluvian world that a flood is coming without telling Noah to build an ark. And, tell, and invite the people to get on board. So how would that ever accomplish anything? So if we are to understand God's motivation for giving these messages the way he did, we'll have to examine all three of them, one at a time and in sequence. And no, I'm not going to try to unpack all these messages today. You don't have to start looking at your watch just yet. But this will have to be part one. Parts two and three will have to come sometime later. And so for right now, this calls for the steadfast endurance of all you holy ones. There is a curious statement and clue that we get from the pen of inspiration comes from a publication called Review and Herald, and it reads, several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I've answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. And so. How in the world do you get from justification by faith to the mark of the beast? Well, this suggests at the beginning that there is a line of logic to follow from point to point. There are dots that we need to connect. And so let's start at point A, which will be the first angel's message, which is Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7. Oop, wrong button. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue 
and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So the three angels' messages begins with something that the angel calls the everlasting gospel. Why would he do that? Well, chapters 13 and 14 of the Revelation um, bring it to a climax of human history. It's where we see the end time calls to worship. Chapter 13 issues the call to worship the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast. And it's the way of uh, this unholy trio to employ deception and coercion to enforce worship on the unwitting and the unwilling. But in contrast, in chapter 14, God employs love and truth to invite willing worship of him. So what's the good news? Well, we're told early on that our first parents fell to the deceptions of the serpent and that they failed God's test of loyalty. And in doing so, they thus invoked the law of sin and death. Their failure would lead to their self-destruction. And all of us children of theirs have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as the scriptures tell us. And we would be on that same path to self-destruction. But God has a remedy. Amen? He would manifest himself in human flesh, redeem our failures, offer himself in substitution for the death that we deserve, and return to heaven triumphant, and then he would empower us through the Holy Spirit to live a trusting, righteous life, just like him, just as though we had been innocent all along. And that, dear friends, is the everlasting gospel. And check out the words of the Apostle Peter here in his first letter, chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. Here Peter says, For even hereto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, Amen. who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live to righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were, past tense, as sheep going astray, but are now, present tense, returned to the shepherd and, and bishop or overseer of your souls. Amen. Imagine God Almighty, manifest in human flesh, bore all our sins, yours and mine, in his own person on the cross, Jesus did this so that we could be dead to sin, not dead in sin, but alive to righteousness. And this is the fiat declaration of faith that Jesus is our substitute for sin and our source for, uh, for righteousness, his righteousness. And we receive that by faith, by choosing to accept, not by trying hard. Justification by faith is the foundation 
of the everlasting gospel. It's the rock upon which Jesus Christ has built his church, with he himself being the chief cornerstone. The pen of inspiration explains it this way. As the penitent sinner contrite before God discerns Christ's atonement in his behalf and accepts this atonement as his only hope in this life and the future life, his sins are pardoned. This is justification by faith. Every believing soul is to conform his will entirely to God's will. And notice, and keep in a state of repentance and contrition, exercising faith in the atoning merits of the Redeemer and advancing from strength to strength, from glory to glory, from the book Faith and Works, page 103. So Jesus is our only hope as we confess and repent. But notice we also need to remain in this state of confession and repentance. The sins of our past were forgiven when we accept Jesus, but now as we go forward, if we stumble and fall and transgress God's law, then we confess and repent again to remain in that, that state of, of justification. So you see, the, the power of the gospel has set us free already from the penalty of sin. That's to those who believe. The power of the gospel is in the, about the work of setting us free from the power of sin. And before Jesus comes in all of his glory, the power of the gospel will set us free from the presence of sin. The power of the gospel is to remove forever the existence of all sin. So fear God, give glory to him, and worship him. That's the three-part injunction that we have in the first angel's message. Well, how do you do that? And, and what is that supposed to look like? Well, remember the issue that's confronting the whole world at the end of all things is worship. And it's a law of worship that by beholding, we become changed. That is, we, we become like who or what it is that occupies our time, our attention, our affection, and even our substance. And this kind of worship, in reality, it's devotional in nature. It's devotional in its essence. Th this call is to fear God, to give glory to him and worship him, it's a call to abide in Jesus and he abide in us. It's to have this living, active, vital relationship together. For the person who is lulled into a, a state of carnal security by having a nominal worship experience, he or she may be led to think they are deserving of eternal life, no matter how they live, no matter what they do. But to exclude a living, abiding relationship with Jesus and in Jesus, that's a fool's errand. So no, the injunction of the first angel is to fear God to reverently acknowledge Jesus as lover of her soul, not only as sovereign of all creation, but also sovereign of the life, seated on the throne of the heart. 
So this calls for an obedient, trusting faith. To give glory to him, it's always true of the Bible that it's helpful to compare scripture with scripture. There is a law called the law of first mention, and it teaches that the earliest mention of a concept or a teaching in scripture is a basis for understanding uh, later mentions of a similar concept or teaching. And it's because of this law of first mention that uh, makes the book of Revelation understandable to us because Revelation has hundreds of allusions to the Old Testament. So those allusions, along with the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, give us understanding of what Revelation is teaching us. So what is the first mention of giving glory to God? Well, you find it in the book of Joshua, chapter 7. And the storyline there is that following Israel's astounding uh, victory there at um, okay at the walls of Jericho. Sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Usually I say I can't chew and walk gum at the same time. That's how confused I get. So anyhow, all right. Um, they had a rousing victory at Jericho, their, their first conquest in the land of Canaan. And that was followed by a humiliating feat, a defeat at the smaller and more vulnerable town of Ai. Now, why did that happen? Well, it's revealed in the scriptures that someone had taken possession of idolatrous items from, from Jericho. They had been forbidden to do that. And, um, and this is what led to their defeat at Ai. So to find out who did this, what happened and why it happened, they go through this process of elimination, um, clan by clan, and then family by family, and then person by person. And they wind up with this man by the name of, of Achan. We can pick up the narrative here in the, in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, and verse 19. And Joshua said to Achan, my son, give, I pray you, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him and tell me now what you have done and hide it not from me. Did you catch the first mention there? He said, give glory to God and make confession to him. And this is God's end time appeal, appeal through the first angel. It's God's appeal to you and to me to have a clear conscience toward him. Is there a besetting sin that we struggle with? Is there something or someone that we like to think about and talk about more than what Jesus has done for us? and is at work to set us free for all eternity? Are there idols in our home that cause us to live a defeated life, not the victorious life in Jesus? Does it ever feel hard, if not impossible, to forgive someone who has violated you in some way. This, this is serious business, friends. Our end time world is hurtling toward that line that you and I dare not cross. From the person standing here to all of you, it would behoove us all 
to take stock of our lives and our homes and consider what might hinder the power of God to transform our lives. The end is near. So worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. This end time call, as you've heard our pastor mention numerous times, is almost verbatim what the fourth commandment says. So let's go to Exodus chapter 20, uh, beginning at verse 8. And here we read, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you... Uh, six days shall you work and... Uh, pardon me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's start this over again. I'm, I'm trying to chew and walk gum at the same time. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. It's so easy to go to this commandment and to point out the elements of the seal of God's authority. It has his name, it has his title, and it has its territory. So we have his name, the Lord your God, and his title, the maker, and his territory of heaven and earth, the sea and all that are in them. It's so easy to say we should worship God on the seventh day Sabbath, the day he blessed, the day he declared to be holy. And we should. We should. We should. But please understand this, that the one who keeps your heart beating and is giving you your next breath is the one who's about the business of making you and me holy. Be holy, for I am holy, says the Lord, as Peter wrote in his first epistle. And there he was making reference to numerous times in the book of Leviticus where God said, Be holy, for I am holy. Look, a holy day is empty without holy beings enjoying the presence of a holy God. The seventh day is a sign. It's a sign. It's a sign. The power of God to transform the life, the power to make us holy, that is the reality of Sabbath. So what does devotional worship of, cre of a creator God in a judgment hour look like? I would suggest it includes a day of worship, but it goes beyond that day. It goes to the heart of what absorbs one's time and attention and affection. And it goes to one's experience with Jesus 
on a daily basis. A daily experience with Jesus is one of a conscious awareness of his abiding presence right here with me. An experience of growing in his grace, an experience of more of Jesus and less of self. Devotional worship is the experience of being made holy. The first message lends an urgency to this command to fear God and give glory to him and worship him because it says in there that the hour of his judgment is come. From Noah's time to Abraham and Lot's time to Moses and Pharaoh and on and on throughout the Bible, a time of judgment indicates that a people or a nation are about to cross that line of self-destruction. This end time judgment hour can be a mysterious concept to someone without the understanding of the Day of Atonement that was taught in the sanctuary services of ancient Israel. Disobedience in defiance of God causes a response in him that the Bible calls wrath. Wrath is stuff, real stuff. It is the curse of sin. Wrath is divine indignation. It's God's revulsion to what sin does to us. The Apostle Paul describes the process clearly in Romans chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And we read, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever you are that judges. For wherein you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you that judge do the same things. Isn't that just so true? But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And think you this, O oh man, that judges them which do such things and does the same, that you shall escape the judgment of God? Or despise you the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Notice verse 5. But after your hardness and impenitent heart, you treasure up to yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Paul here teaches that the grace of God leads us to repentance, but it's the rejection of his grace that causes us to store up wrath, awaiting a day when the righteous judgment of God is revealed. Where is wrath stored up? And when is the day of wrath? Those are two questions that are answered in the book of Revelation uh, in chapter 6, and beginning at verse 14. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men, every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath 
of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb? Hide us from the angry baby sheep? Really? Well, yes, really, but it might not be what you think it is. The everlasting gospel teaches that Jesus took upon his person the curse, the wrath of all humanity, the divine indignation, all the stuff that you and I are guilty of. In the garden, he prayed, Father, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. That was the cry of revulsion of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us that Jesus endured this cross and that he despised the shame. When Jesus ascended to heaven, sinless and victorious, he took with him the wrath of the whole world with him. And how do we know that? Because the unbelievers are crying for the rocks to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb. A time of judgment is needed. This is a time of settling of accounts to determine who is the rightful ownership of all this wrath that is stored up in heaven. This is a time of judgment that is already in progress and has been for many years. Don't know how much longer it will be. Confessing and repenting believers, we are divert, divested of our wrath. The unrepentant believers, the unrepentant unbelievers, excuse me, well, they retain the ownership of their wrath, all that they are responsible for, according to Paul. And so when this moral audit of sorts is completed, Jesus comes again. He will declare, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. He will bring all of this wrath with him and he'll return it to the rightful owners when he comes again. The unrepentant unbelievers receive back the wrath that they are responsible for. And, and Satan and his minions, well, they receive the wrath that you and I and all believers have repented of and forsaken. They receive this wrath for the sins of which they tempted us. So what we wind up with in the first angel's message is this. There is an everlasting gospel, a true gospel, proclaiming that God himself, manifest in human flesh, lived the life of humanity in sinless victory, redeeming the failures of all humankind, yours and mine included. He willingly took the collective guilt of the whole world to the cross, despising the shame. He took our death sentence upon himself in exchange for imparting the imparting of his life and righteousness. And all believers who willingly receive this grace will come to a place of atonement, a place of at one meant with Jesus. 
to come to a place of confession and repentance, however many times it takes. They come to a place of forgiveness. They come uh, to a place of forsaking the old life of sin and living the new life of Jesus. They come to the reality of rest. They come to the reality of Sabbath, the reality of which the seventh day is the sign of God's supreme authority in the life. So here at the end of time, the honest in heart will hear this cry of love to turn back and come home. Why, why would you choose to perish? Do you hear Jesus plead to you and me? Are you willing to obey his call, dear friend? Now God has many, many children in the world who have not heard this message yet and they do not understand the beauty of the true gospel. Some are held captive willingly to a false gospel, a counterfeit system of worship. Some are captivated deceptively to a false gospel, and some are coerced forcibly to accept a false gospel. So when I next have the privilege of standing here before you, we'll explore the rise and the fall of Babylon as declared by the second angel. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we will spend the rest of eternity striving to understand the kind of love that would cause you to step down from your realm of glory and clothe yourself with humanity, come as a tiny babe, live in a humble family of circumstance, Show us who the Father is really like and then take upon us, take upon yourself the curse that belong to us. We will for eternity be falling at your feet and worshiping you. We choose to worship you now. We choose to open our hearts to your grace and to your power to save. And we choose to share your love in this dying world while we still can. So please hear our plea and make us willing. In Jesus' name, amen.